Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are, and happy Saturday. My name is Takiwa Smith. I'm founder and executive director of Science Engineering Mathematics, Lincoln Incorporated, and I want to welcome you to our Math and Science Career Academy's STEM in the City Workshop. The STEM in the City Workshop is a program of our Math and Science Career Academy, and the purpose of this workshop is to teach teens how science is all around us and impact our everyday lives in the fields of earth and environmental sciences. These sciences are some of the scientists that impact our everyday lives, our access to clean water, the air we breathe, the soil we grow our food, food in, the soil we play in when we go to the beach, the food we eat. Um, it impacts so many areas of our lives, but it's fields that we don't often consider that is science because we go about our business, enjoying the world around us, eating our food, enjoying the beach, eating our seafood. And we wanted to make students aware of these careers because they are also careers that not many people pursue, not because they don't have the potential, but they don't know that they exist. And we want you all to know they exist so we can have you saving the planet, doing research to make sure our air quality is good, fight climate change, fight the um, ocean acidification, all of these issues that impact our everyday life dealing with our earth and the planet that we live on and our ecosystems. We have a special edition of the STEM and City Workshop, which Carlin will go into because Tuesday was World Water Day, right, Carlin? Yes, okay. Yes. Tuesday was World Water Day, which highlights the importance of water. Like, water is a part of our everyday lives, right? We drink it, we clean ourselves, we clean our clothes, we have fun in it when we go to the beach and lakes to swim, to kayak, all of those things. And so, but without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to our program, Carlin program coordinator, Carlin Pounders. I'm sorry, I'm a little struggling with words on this Saturday. <laughs> Who is going to introduce our speaker and our topic for this today's STEM in the City. All right, thank you, Tequila. So today's speaker is Jacqueline Rosa, who is a marine scientist, environmental educator, and science communicator. She received her BS in marine science from the University of Maine and spent five years as an outdoor educator, connecting students of all ages with ocean science curriculum. As the program coordinator of Blue Latitudes Foundation, Jacqueline's work is focused on developing the organization's innovative programs and initiatives, as well as conducting public outreach and engagement activities. So as Tequila said, um, earlier this week, it was World Water Day, and um, World Water Day is really a celebration of water and our um, connections to it, how we use it, both for scientific purposes and in our everyday lives, as Dikiwa said. So today, um, you know, many of you are familiar with the ocean and going to the beach and get a lot of enjoyment out of that, but Jacqueline is going to talk to us about um, ocean conservation and ocean science. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jacqueline. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here this morning. Again, my name is Jacqueline Rosa. Um, I'm a marine scientist and I'm the program coordinator for the Blue Latitudes Foundation. Today I'm coming to you from California. That's where I live and work and do a lot of the science. Um, and so I'm going to be talking to you today about my background, about uh, my career path, and also about the work I'm doing with remotely operated vehicles. So I'm going to start off um, talking about my background. Um, I grew up on the East Coast in Connecticut, um, so very far away from California. And I love spending time outdoors when I was younger, specifically at the beach. I enjoyed wandering around the waterline, collecting crabs and snails, and exploring what lives under the rocks. So my interest in the ocean started very young. When I was in high school, um, I enjoyed my science and my math classes, but I also liked art. I um, 
and I love to write. And so when I was growing up, going through high school, I wasn't quite sure there was a major that combined all of my interests. Um, and I struggled a little bit when applying for colleges because um, I wasn't aware of any of the opportunities in the STEM field. All of the adults I knew were, you know, in business field or teachers. Um, and so um, marine science wasn't something that was really on my radar. Luckily, when I was applying to schools, I came across the University of Maine, um, and they have a very unique program that includes um, a semester by the sea. And during the semester by the sea, college students would live right next to the water, and they would get to go out on boats, take scuba diving classes, um, go in the tide pools and out in the mud and collect animals and bring them back to the lab. So as a hands-on learner and someone who loves to be outside and not really in the classroom, um, this program ultimately led me to apply to the University of Maine and attend that school. Um, so I studied marine science and during my summers in between my years at school, I did a few internships. And no matter what field you go into, whether it's math or engineering or video game design, um, their internships are a great way to get a taste for the work that you're doing and see if it's a good fit for you. So I had two internships. The first one was in South Carolina, so a little bit closer to Georgia. And during my internship there, I studied a specific kind of crab called the fiddler crab. Now, if you've ever been to the marsh, you might recognize this crab. It has one big claw and one tiny claw. And these live in the, um, in the marsh area, in the mud, and I studied their habitat specifically. I did another internship at the Darling Marine Center. And for this internship, I studied lobsters and scallops, and I fed the animals in the lab, I cleaned their tanks, um, and I also collected some of these animals from the water. Um, additionally, I spent a lot of time on boats, which I love to be outside in the field. So all of these skills came in handy um, after I graduated from college. You know, I after I graduated, I moved to Catalina Island, which is an island off the coast of California. And I got a job teaching marine science at the Catalina Island Marine Institute. So for three years, I educated students about um, ocean habitats, about ocean animals. Um, and I brought groups of students on snorkel, um, snorkel trips, hiking trips, kayaking trips. And it was the perfect blend of being outside and teaching science. I love sharing my passion for marine science with others. After spending three years on Catalina, I got another job teaching science um, as an outdoor educator at Vida Verde Nature Education in Northern California. And with students, I would take them to the Redwood Forest to learn about forest biology. We would go explore the tide pools. Um, so again, I was outside teaching, something that was a really good fit for me. After about five years of teaching, however, I wanted to do something a little bit different. And, you know, when you grow up, you don't always have to stick with the same career path or even doing the same job in the same STEM field. You can switch and try different things. And so at some point, I wanted to try something different and challenge myself. And um, so I applied for the position of program coordinator with the Blue Latitudes Foundation. The Blue Latitudes Foundation was started by two women in California who were really passionate about the ocean um, and saw that there were many um, like challenges that the ocean are facing, such as, um, you know, the destruction of natural habitats and ocean acidification and climate change. And they wanted to tackle those issues in creative ways. So they've started this nonprofit organization and we do a lot of research. Um, we also do a lot of education and outreach like I'm doing today with you. Um, so as the program coordinator, I wear many different hats. Um, I um, do, uh, I write reports, I apply for grant funding to get money to fund our different research projects. I give STEM presentations like I'm doing today. Um, and a lot of it is communicating science to diverse audiences. So students, adults, people who are um, fishers, people who work in the oil and gas industry. Um, so really I do a lot of connecting with different members of the public. Now let's talk about what it's like to be a marine scientist. 
Um, and again, this was a job that I didn't know of when I was younger. I didn't know that you could study the ocean. So um, if you really love the ocean, this could be a potential career opportunity for you. Um, and as a marine scientist, our job can be split up into three parts. The first one is teaching, so sharing our love for the ocean with others. And teaching people of all ages and backgrounds about the ocean is incredibly important um, because the better we can understand the ocean, the better we can protect it. And there's so many people around the planet, um, and it really takes everyone making positive life changes to support ocean health. Next up, we have field work. This is probably my favorite part of being a marine scientist. Field work is when we go out into the field, and that could mean being out on a research boat, going to the beach, um, going underwater, scuba diving, or you know, walking along some of the tide pools and collecting science. A lot of the research that we do and the data that we collect takes place when we do field work. Next up, we have research and report writing. So as you may know, there is still so much to know about our oceans. It's estimated that 90% of the global ocean has yet to be mapped. So there is a lot to explore, a lot to discover and record and understand. But a question I have for all of you, something to think about as you're watching this presentation is, how do we study what's below the surface when we can't go diving? What are some tools that scientists can use to study habitats that may be out of reach? One tool that we can use are called remotely operated vehicles, and I'll refer to them as ROVs in this presentation. Here are some examples of ROVs. They come in all shapes and sizes and colors. Some of them are as small as a basketball. Some of them are as large as a Volkswagen Beetle. So they can really range in size, um, but they have a few similarities. And I want you to imagine an ROV like a remotely operated car, but underwater, it's something that you can drive. ROVs have cameras that can record photos and videos. They have lights. Um, sometimes interior and exterior lights or lights on the side, because as you descend deeper into the ocean, light disappears. So having those lights to illuminate things that we're seeing is very helpful. Some ROVs also have lasers on the front that can measure the size of fish or invertebrates like uh, clams or mussels. And many have sampling arms to collect samples of, of animals or sand. I wanna introduce you to the kind of ROV that the Blue Latitudes Foundation is using. This is called the Deep Trekker ROV. And the Deep Trekker, uh, Deep Trekker is a company that is founded by a woman in Canada. Um, she's really passionate about technology and started this company. Um, and they have many different kinds of ROV. This is the one that we utilize. It's um, a little bit bigger than a basketball, weighs about 20 pounds and has some really cool features that I'm going to walk you through. So first off, we have the robot itself. You can see the camera moves up and down that panel um, so we can scan to look at what we're looking at. It has external lights to help illuminate things that we see. It has a grabber arm to pick things up. And this ROV specifically can dive to um, around 600 feet deep in the ocean. So it gives us a lot of room to explore. Now you may be wondering, well, how do you operate it? How does this thing work if the robot's below the water and we're standing on the surface? We utilize this controller um, and it's similar to a video game controller. So if you are someone that enjoys playing video games, I bet you would be really good at operating this ROV. The uh, controller has two joysticks, so we can move the ROV forwards, backwards, left, right, up and down. And the controller is connected to the ROV using this bright yellow tether, also called a communication cable. And the tether is about 300 feet long. Um, so really, we can, we can dive and explore some pretty deep and interesting areas. Here, um, so ROVs around the world are used to explore natural and artificial reefs. A natural reef is an area like a coral reef. What we have here, um, this is an example of coral reefs in Florida. There's a lot of these um, in like those tropical areas. Um, another example of a natural reef uh, is this rocky reef here in California. So a natural reef is something that occurs naturally in the environment. Um, and there's often 
things like the coral and the rocky reef areas um, allow a lot of nooks and crannies for invertebrates and fish to live in. You can see here in this photo in California, we have urchins. You might recognize that animal. Um, we also have sea stars or starfish that are growing, and there's barnacles and algae. Um, so it really provides a great habitat for all of these animals. An artificial reef is something that is made by humans. Uh, an artificial reef can be a pier, a pile of concrete. This is a reef ball. So you can see um, it was concrete that's poured into a shape and inside it's hollow. So it allows a hiding place for fish to come and feel safe and maybe lay a nest of eggs. Um, and over time, animals like barnacles, mussels, algae, corals will settle on these and start to grow. Here are some other examples. This is a shipwreck um, acting as an artificial reef. Um, and this one is neat. So this is actually an art installation also made of concrete. So over time, this is pretty early on in the stage of the artificial reef, but over time, like I mentioned, those animals will start to come and grow on those structures. Now you may be wondering, why do we build artificial reefs. Why do we need them if we have natural reefs occurring um, in our environment? Well, many of the natural reefs, unfortunately, have been destroyed over time um, due to human impacts like development of our coastlines, pollution, um, or other human impacts. So artificial reefs provide additional habitat or extra places for marine life to live. Okay, so the Blue Latitudes Foundation is using the ROV to collect data on marine life living on natural and artificial reefs in California. As mentioned, an artificial reef is something that's made by a human. Um, and here we have an example. This is a pier. Um, a pier is, you know, a place where that like kind of, it's a structure that sticks out over the water and you can fish off of the pier. Some people pull their boats up onto the pier to get on and off of them. Um, and a few months ago, I took the ROV out to this pier and drove it. And I explored some of those concrete pilings underneath the pier. And I saw a lot of algae growing, uh, barnacles, and even some shellfish. So from this picture on the left-hand side, there's a lot of numbers on that picture. And if you look closely, um, you can see the temperature, okay, right here. So there's a lot of information that the ROV can tell us. It tells us that it was 63 degrees Fahrenheit that day in the water. We can tell the direction that we're facing. We are facing 260 degrees west. Knowing the direction we're driving the ROV is very useful because we don't want to lose the ROV under the water. We want to be aware of where we're driving it. Um, and it also tells us the depth. So in this picture, um, we were just right under the surface, just about one foot deep. Now, while I can't take all of you out with me in San Diego to drive the ROV, I'm going to show you a short clip of a recent trip that we did um, out in the water. So as mentioned, the ROV allows us to collect science and explore the ocean while staying dry. And during this trip, we launched the ROV from kayaks. So we brought kayaks down to the beachfront um, and launching the ROV is a two person job. So we have the founders of Blue Latitudes Foundation here, Amber and Emily. One of them is driving the ROV. The other one is operating that bright yellow tether to make sure it doesn't get tangled. And the area we explored that day has a rocky, it's a rocky area, lots of algae or seaweed growing. We saw the bright orange fish, which is the Garibaldi, the state fish of California. And this was a really healthy reef area because it's a marine protected area, which means that there is no fishing allowed. So it allows animals to thrive. At the end of the day, we reel back in that communication tether, haul the ROV back into the kayaks, and we paddled back to shore. So in the past, we've also launched this remotely operated vehicle um, off of the pier. Like I mentioned, we've also taken a boat offshore of California um, and launched the ROV that way. So there's a lot of options for us. Okay. Here's some other videos that I want to share with you taken by an ROV a little bit deeper in the ocean. Um, so in this video, we have a species of fish called amberjacks, and they're swimming around an artificial reef in the Gulf of Mexico. Maybe some of you have been visited the Gulf of Mexico with family or friends. And amberjack are a pelagic species. The word pelagic means that um, these fish like to swim in deeper waters. 
um, in open waters further from the coastline. But sometimes we see um, pelagic species like the amberjack coming to these artificial reefs to feed on smaller fish. Um, so when you put a structure out in the ocean, whether that's um, an oil and gas platform or a pile of rocks or a shipwreck, over time, it, become, it attracts invertebrates, it attracts smaller fish, and it becomes this beautiful home, this area where marine life can thrive. So these amberjacks will come to these structures to feed on those smaller fish. Okay, next up we have a school of fish. Um, here we see a school of creole fish, and they're swimming in a specific type of school called a shoal. A shoal is um, a large group of fish that swim together in an organized manner for social reasons. And fish school for a number of reasons in the ocean. Um, first off, protection from predators. There is safety in numbers, you know, when you're swimming all together. It also makes swimming easier because the swimming in a school reduces friction so fish can save their energy. Um, and also for social reasons, fish, some fish uh, spawn in larger groups, which helps ensure that their eggs will become fertilized and also be protected from predators. So far, we've seen large fish on the ROV, but I want you to look closely at this video. And if you look at this uh, concrete structure, you'll see light red fish darting around the screen. Um, and these fish are called cryptic fish. Well, they're a species of fish that are also called cryptic fish. Um, a cryptic meaning that they use their environment to blend in. Why would a fish want to blend in with its environment? Well, first off, protection from predators. Uh, maybe they have a nest there and they want to be tucked away. Um, so this specific kind of fish um, uses other organisms like corals as a shelter and protection from predators. And the ROV is a great tool to study these cryptic fish a little bit closer um, because they're difficult to see from the surface. And even when you're scuba diving, it's difficult to see these fish. So what does a marine scientist do with all the data we collect from the ROV? Well, it can tell us a number of things. First off, it can tell us um, that it can uh, make us aware of the presence of an invasive species. Now, invasive means an organism that is not native to a particular ecosystem. So it might have might be native to another area and it found its way to a new environment. Here we see pictures of two species that were found in the Gulf of Mexico. The top one is orange cup coral and the bottom one is a kind of fish called a lionfish. Many, maybe some of you recognize the lionfish. Um, so these species are native to the Indo-Pacific region, but they found their way to the Gulf of Mexico. And this becomes an issue when these invasive species outcompete native species for resources like um, habitat and food. And in the case of the lionfish, there are no natural predators um, of the lionfish in the Gulf of Mexico. And so the lionfish have been able to grow in numbers and take a lot of the habitat and food from some of the other species. Uh, from some, from some of the other uh, species that are in that area. ROVs can also help us um, measure, measure fish length or length of other invertebrates we might see like mussels or scallops or anemones. You might have seen these bright green uh, lines in some of the earlier videos I showed you. And those are the lasers that I mentioned earlier. Um, so when a fish swims in between those lasers, we can pause the video that we take using the ROV and take a screenshot similar to a screenshot you would take on your smartphone. We then use this formula to calculate the length of the fish. Why is it important to know the fish length? Well, it can give us an idea of um, how many adult fish or juvenile or younger fish there are in a certain area. Um, and that helps us to understand um, the health of the fish population. ROVs can also traverse or go around a structure or a reef to record marine life. So imagine if a marine scientist were to drive an ROV, you know, every 10 feet deep in the water. We can get an idea of what that entire community looks like. Um, we can gather data about what depth fish like to hang out in or um, where certain species of coral are living. So we want to gain yeah, an overall understanding of um, the, the health of a certain community, whether that's a natural reef or an artificial reef. 
All right, so now it's your turn to be a marine scientist. Um, I'm gonna give everyone about a minute of time to gather the materials for this activity. The only materials you need are a piece of paper and something to write with. So pen, pencil, marker, marker you get to choose. I'll give everyone a few moments to get ready and then we'll dive into our activity. Okay, here we go. So we are going to do a marine life survey together. Scientists often complete marine life surveys to understand, like I mentioned, how healthy a community is and learn about what types of species are present in a marine environment, whether that's at a kelp forest, a rocky reef, a coral reef, or even along a sandy bottom. So today we are going to do a marine life survey at an artificial reef in California. Um, specifically, this is at a oil platform that is off the coast of California. And over time, that structure underwater starts to um, be encrusted with anemones and barnacles and sea stars and mussels um, and also attracts fish. So I have some videos that I'm going to share with you um, and we're going to record what we see. We're going to identify those species together. First, let's walk through the steps of a marine life survey. Step one, collect videos of marine life in the ocean using an ROV. Um, or you can, uh, scuba divers will bring underwater cameras or videos with them to record what they see. Step two, download those videos to the computer. Step three, learn about local species. Now, this is an important step because um, different kinds of marine animals um, live in different parts of the world. There are species of uh, fish that only live in the Gulf of Mexico or species of fish that only live in Hawaii. And so when you're looking at videos from a certain area of the ocean, you want to be familiar about um, the species you might see so you can correctly identify them when you're doing a marine life survey. And as mentioned, the final step of a marine life survey is to watch those videos and identify those species. The first steps, step number one and step number two, have already been completed by me. I've collected those videos for you today. So we will do step number three and four together. All right. So keep in mind that these animals are not found all over the world, but in areas um, surrounding California. There are four species that we're going to learn today. The first one is the blue rockfish. There are many species of rockfish in California. Uh, today, we're going to keep our eyes peeled for the blue rockfish specifically. Now, the blue rockfish is dark blue. It has almost a spotted, spotted pattern on its body, and it has a wide caudal fin. Fish have many fins on their body, but focus on the tail fin. That is called the caudal fin um, on a fish. And if you look at this photo in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that caudal fin. It's very wide. It's filled in. Um, and that strong caudal fin allows them to swim and maneuver quite, quite easily in different habitats. Next, we have the California sheephead. Now, this is a one of my favorite fish. Um, you can actually identify the gender of the fish based on the color of the animal. Um, California sheephead are all born female. The females are light red, you can see in this picture. Um, and the larger female in an area will actually transition into a male fish towards the end. Um, and the males are half black and half red. They're almost like, it's like black, red, black, little sandwich there. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for this male sheephead when we watch our videos. Okay. Um, and now we have a smaller fish, the Salema. Um, so the Salema are pretty small. They're about six to 18 inches long. And the younger fish are mainly carnivorous. So they eat crustaceans like crabs, um, while the adults are almost exclusively um, herbivores. They feed on algae. Um, the Salema have larger eyes and these horizontal stripes that go along their body. So that's unique to them. Remember that fact about them. That will help you identify them in the videos. And they're also very shiny. You can notice the light is reflecting off of them in these two pictures. Next, this is not a fish. This is a marine mammal. Um, 
we have the California sea lion, uh, not to be confused with a seal. There's quite, there's a few differences between the two of them. Sea lions have a longer snout um, and they have these wing-like front flippers, which help them move forward. And these front flippers and the hind or the back flippers also help them move easily on land. Sea lions live in coastal waters, but they can also be found on beaches or hauled up on uh, docks or piers or buoys. Um, they're really intelligent animals. Uh, they can often be seen in zoos or aquariums, and they're really playful. Often when we go on our scuba dives here in California, sea lions will come and check us out and swim pretty close to us. Um, they're really neat to see underwater. Okay. We're just about to start our marine life survey, but first I'd like you all to take your writing utensil and your piece of paper and set up your data sheet. And this is how I would like you to set it up. First, draw one long horizontal line and one vertical line down the middle. Next, I'd like you to write animal on the left-hand side and number on the right-hand side. And you can write each of our species below the animal side. We have our rockfish, the blue rockfish, it's spotted, has that wide caudal fin, the California sheephead, which is half black and half red, our salema, which is the smaller fish that's silvery with those horizontal stripes, and then our marine mammal, the California sea lion. So take a moment to write down these animals on your data sheet. Now on the right hand side, we are going to leave that blank for now. Um, we are going to tally the different animals that we see as we watch each video. And the animals move quite quickly in the video. So we will watch the video all the way through together. And then I took some screenshots for us to look at and we can count the number of species that we see. Okay, here we go. So this is the first video. Remember, this was taken at an artificial, this was taken at an offshore oil and gas platform in California. Um, so these large uh, concrete pile, excuse me, not concrete, steel um, structures harbor a lot of marine life and it's a really healthy reef. So let's dive in and check this out. So we have a school of fish swimming around. Those bright pink things on over here on the left side of the screen, those are all anemones. We also see some scallops right here. Um, lots of life. Next slide. Okay. Bear with me. <laughs> okay, this is our first screenshot. So I want you to think about the animals that we reviewed and count the number of fish you see and write that down on your data sheet. So if you're thinking this is the Salema fish, you are correct. We have a little school of the Salema fish swimming around. Um, and as mentioned, the adults are um, herbivores. So they will feed on algae or seaweed that grows along these steel beams and cross beams. Okay, this is our second screenshot. We've already counted the Salema fish at the top, but there's another fish that I'd like you to keep your eyes peeled for. You can also see a scuba diver in the background of this screenshot. If you're thinking that you see the California male sheep head, you are correct. We have a pretty large California sheep head here at the bottom. California sheep head can grow up to three feet long um, and they they love to eat sea urchins, actually, um, as well as different mollusks like uh, mussels and scallops. So the offshore platforms are a great place. They attract a lot of sheephead because those animals, the animals that they eat, are found on these cross beams. So, so far, your data sheet should look like this. We saw one sheephead and eight Salema. So take a moment to can finish up your data sheet record those numbers. Okay. Here's our second video. Look closely and see what kind of fish you can see. All right, 
let's watch let's watch that one again there's a lot going on here see a lot of those bright pink strawberry anemones growing we have a few different kinds of fish swimming around and i'd also like to pause the video right here all of these little brown things that are sticking up, each one is a sea star, also called a starfish. Um, these are a kind of sea star called a brittle star. And on these structures, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of these brittle stars growing. So when I went scuba diving at this specific location, um, you can see all of their arms moving around. Um, really exciting to see those. Okay, we'll wrap up the video and then we'll take a look at our screenshots. This is our first screenshot. And if you have identified this as the blue rockfish, you are correct. They have that spotted pattern on their body. Here's our second screenshot. So record on your data sheet what you see. If you recorded a second blue rockfish, you're correct, and we have one Salema right here. It's sideways, so it's a little difficult to identify, but it has that slender body, um, and you can make out those horizontal stripes as well. All right, checking in with our data sheet, we've seen two rockfish so far, one California sheephead, and nine Salema fish. Okay, and here is our final video. Before I start it, take a look at this uh, steel beam. We have a lot of blue mussels. Um, they appear black, their, their name is the California blue mussel. Um, we have a lot of those brittle stars, their uh, arms reaching out, we have anemones. Um, so a lot of food available for fish in the area. Okay, here we go. This video was taken by a scuba diver, actually. And if you, there's some things happening in the background. Now, if you see the cow, you probably see these California sea lions. Like I mentioned, they're really playful and they get pretty close to that scuba diver on the left. We can watch it again. All right. Okay. Here's our first screenshot. I'd like you to count the number of sea lines that we have in this video. Um, you might notice this video is a little bit less clear than the others. So in the ocean, um, the visibility can vary and visibility means how clear the water is. So this video is taken quite deep on the offshore oil and gas platform. And sometimes as you go deeper in the water, the water gets a little less clear. And that depends on weather conditions like wind um, or if there's any, if there's strong upwelling or currents taking place um, or any particulate matter that's in the water column. So the visibility is a little bit lower here, but if you identified and counted two California sea lions over here, you are correct. Here's our second screenshot. I'd like you to count the number of sea lions we have here. Again, they're a little tricky to see, but you can make out their body shape. So in this screenshot, we have one sea lion and a second one that's hiding behind. So in total, we have four sea lions. Cool. So now that we've completed our marine life survey, let's talk about why collecting this data is important. And now imagine if we visited the, this same spot at the offshore oil and gas platform every day, we would see different animals. We might even see different animals depending on the time of day or the depth that we visit. So it's important for marine scientists um, 
to study different areas in our oceans so we can understand how healthy a reef is. We can discover um, what kinds of species are in the area, if the population is high, if the population is low. Um, taking a closer look at marine communities um, can also reveal if there's something negative happening, negative happening in the environment, like a lack of food or pollution or a presence of a species that is invasive, like that lionfish. So great job, everyone, on your marine life survey. Um, this is something that scientists do all around the world, whether that's via ROV, they take videos with the ROV um, and process those videos on the computer. A lot of marine life surveys are done on scuba um, and also just walking along the, the tide, walking along the beach. When the tide drops on the beach, some scientists will go out and count the number of anemones or barnacles that they see or snails growing, um, growing along the shoreline. So this is a really important um, piece of being a marine scientist, something that's used really frequently for our data collection. Now, I want to end um, with a few tips about how you can protect um, our oceans from home. Some of you may live far from the ocean or visit the beach infrequently, but there's still so many ways that you can support a healthy ocean from where you're at. The first one is to um, focus on the things that you are utilizing in your everyday life. Focus on the things that you are buying. Um, I encourage you to reduce your use of single use plastics, you know, have your reusable water bottle. Maybe you bring a uh, fork, knife and spoon from home when you go get takeout. So you don't have to get those plastic utensils. You can use a metal straw or say no straw, please. When you go out to a place um, and focus on the things that um, you're buying. You know, I often will borrow things from friends. If I just want to use something a few times, I make sure to recycle any things that I'm using. So the actions that you have in your life, even though you're just one person, have a big impact on our planet and specifically our ocean. There are ways that you can participate in science projects, um, even if you're not a marine scientist. Um, the first one I want to introduce you to is called Marine Debris Tracker right here. So the next time you visit a beach with your family or friends, or maybe even on a school field trip, you can download this app. And if you see trash along the beach and it's safe to pick up, you can pick that trash up and record what you find on this app. It's free to download. Um, it's run by National Geographic. Let's say, for example, you see two plastic bottles, um, one hot Cheetos wrapper, and two straws. You can go on that app and record what you see. People all around the world are using this app to record trash that they find on the ocean, or on, excuse me, not in the ocean, but along the beach. And scientists use this data um, to enact policy change, to ban plastic straws, to ban styrofoam cups. Um, and so you can contribute to a global research project by using this app. The second one, is the Seafood Watch app. If you're a fan of seafood like I am or sushi, you can utilize this free app from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and it helps you to find the most sustainably sourced uh, fish or seafood in your area. So when you go to the grocery store with a family member or a friend, or you go out to a restaurant, um, you can check out the label on the seafood that you're eating. You can see where it's from. You can see if it was farmed at a fish farm or, uh, um, or if you can see if it was caught wild. And you can look that up and see, was this caught in a sustainable way that supports the ocean? Um, and the app will help you find the most sustainable choice in your area. Um, next up, participate in a um, community cleanup. The ocean, unfortunately, is downhill of everything. So a piece of trash that gets loose from a garbage can in the middle of Texas might end up in the Gulf of Mexico um, because things travel and it might get carried um, by the wind or um, by a river or a stream. And so participating in a cleanup at a local park, even if it's far from the ocean, can help support ocean health. Um, there are many organizations like Surfrider um, or nonprofit organizations in your area that are probably doing cleanups at parks or watersheds or local rivers that you can participate in. Finally, stay informed. There is so much to know about our oceans and there's new research and information that's coming out every day. There are species that are being discovered very often in the deep sea um, and resources 
such as online, but also places like Netflix and Disney Plus have documentaries such as Mission Blue or The Oceans that dive into um, all different habitats and animals that live in the ocean. So if you're watching this today and you feel excited about the ocean, you want to know more, check out these documentaries and others on these platforms to learn more um, and spread that knowledge with others. Okay, I'd like to end up with some steps for becoming a marine scientist if this is something that interests you. First off, uh, do your best in school. Um, I definitely struggled in some classes when I was younger. Um, even though I love science, I really struggled with my chemistry classes. So reach out to friends around you, to um, other students, to parents, teachers. There's lots of resources um, when you're having a tough time in school. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Second, get involved in research, internships, um, volunteer opportunities. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, volunteer opportunities and internships are a great, great way to figure out if a field is right for you. Um, and there's lots of internships and volunteer opportunities that can be found online, or you can talk to like a guidance counselor at your school and they can help, they can connect you with those resources. Next, continue your education through college and graduate school. If you would like to get your scuba diving certification, this is something that I did when I was in college. I got my basic scuba diving certification. Um, and later on in college, I took some more advanced scuba diving classes that allowed me to go a little bit deeper in the ocean. So having a skill like a scuba diving certification can open up a lot of doors. There are some people who just scuba dive for their, for their job and collect data underwater. And finally, continue to share your love for science in the ocean. Um, this is something, you know, we can only really protect a resource um, if we care about it and we understand it. And the ocean is a source, not just for a place to play and a place to gather, but it provides us with a huge amount of oxygen that we breathe as humans every single day. It's a food source. Um, it helps to, um, coral reefs, for example, um, help to uh, lower the impact of storm or like erosion on coastlines. And so the ocean is so important and we're so deeply connected to this resource as humans. And we have to work together to do our best and protect it. And with that, we can do some questions. I also included my email, Jacqueline at bluelatitudes.org. If you're interested in marine science or remotely operated vehicles, or you would like to know anything or ask me any questions about my career path, feel free to write this down and you can send me an email and we can connect. All right, that was awesome. Um, so I put in the chat, if you guys have any questions for Jacqueline to go ahead and um, put them there and I will read them out. Um, but to get us started, you know, my first question for you is, um, I was so impressed with how much knowledge um, you had of different terms and different fish. Um, and I, I imagine that's just part of being an educator. But um, for, you know, youth teens that are interested in pursuing this STEM pathway, um, what tips would you give to them for um, being able to memorize and, um, you know, be able to know all of the different types of sea life and aspects of the ocean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a part of learning um, different species in the ocean, that... For me, that started in college. Um, I learned a lot about um, fish and about different plankton species and invertebrates. Um, when I moved to Catalina Island and started to teach about the ocean, that's when I really dove into some of these species that are local here in California. I'm someone that learns by... Um, by writing things down um, and also practicing. And so I would go into um, our aquariums that we had at the Catalina Island Marine Institute and I would look at the fish and I would study them and look at their characteristics. Um, and it is difficult because there's thousands of species of fish and corals um, and marine mammals. Um, 
But, you know, whichever your learning style is, go for that. If you're someone that's a visual person, you can make flashcards. If you're someone um, that likes to draw, you can draw those animals um, and color them and, you know, have a notebook filled with all those species. So really work to your strengths and whatever your learning style is, go, go towards that. Uh, my next question uh, that I think would be helpful for um, young people is as far as making connections. Um, would you say that, you know, networking or making certain connections have um, been an uh, advantage, uh, has, have been an advantage for you in, you know, your academics and in your career path? And what tips would you give to um, youth in doing the same, making connections in this mm -hmm. area? Yeah, that's a great question. And as a young person, when I was in middle school and high school and in college, it's a little intimidating to talk to adults sometime um, and ask them, hey, how'd you get to where you are today? Um, but that's really important. And that might be outside of your comfort zone to ask someone about their career path. But I encourage you to gather that courage and ask them because people love talking about what they do. I enjoy when people ask me, what does a marine scientist do? And how did you get to where you are today? Um, I, When I was in college and I was working at the Darling Marine Center and I was doing that internship with lobsters and crabs like I described, there was a person who was in charge of our lab. And um, she was so knowledgeable and so passionate about the ocean. And I asked her, what were the jobs you had to get you to where you are today? And she told me about the Catalina Island Marine Institute. And if I hadn't mm -hmm. asked her, I would have never known about this opportunity that waited for me in California. So she let me know about that opportunity. And that was really the jump. That was my first job out of college. That was my jumping off point. Mm -hmm. um, and so if there's someone that you see um, whether it's, you know, someone um, at an internship or someone on Instagram that is an, a cool scientist or a video game designer or an engineer and um, you admire them, reach out to them, um, send, send them an email, find them on LinkedIn and say, hey, do you, could we have a phone conversation? Could we email back and forth about, um, you know, your career path and what college you went to, what internships you did, what kind of skills you worked on, because it's intimidating to know how to get to one place. So you can ask people for advice. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out to others and make those connections. Um, so my next question is, what are some misconceptions about working in marine mm -hmm. science or pursuing um, this STEM pathway? Sure. I think a misconception would be, um, and one that I had, I can speak from personal experience, one that I had going into it, I thought all of my days would be field days. I would always be scuba diving. I would always be in my bathing suit in the ocean. And there's a lot that happens behind the scenes. Remember some of our job or all of our job is not just field work, um, but it's also writing reports. It's going to the lab and looking at samples under microscopes. Um, it's writing papers about things that we saw. Um, it's doing research. So looking at reading scientific papers and trying to understand a new habitat or a new species. Um, so there's a lot that happens in marine science, whether that's, you know, talking to people or remotely on your computer or underwater. There's a little bit of everything. Um, that's a part of the whole, the whole uh, picture of being a marine scientist. Oh, I think that's a fantastic response, especially, um, you know, with our STEM in the cities highlighting environmental and earth sciences. I think that's really important for kids to know that it is a mix of field mm -hmm. experiences, but also, as you described, being in the lab, reading um, other other literature. Um, so that's that's great for them to know. Um, so. <laughs> My last two questions more so have to do with, I, I can't let you leave without diving into, um, you know, like diving in deep into this uh, STEM area. As far as when I was listening to you talk about fish eating crabs, um, that is not something that I know me personally, I've ever thought that is possible for fish. So how 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 can fish eat crabs? I mean, um, I guess I'm right in saying that they do, they have teeth. Fish have teeth. Can you talk mm -hmm. about 
Sure. How fish eat? <laughs> sure. Um, some fish have very strong and, um, you know, and large teeth. It just depends if they are um, a carnivore or an herbivore. Depends what they're eating. Some fish only eat, you know, plankton, which are um, microscopic plants and animals that live in the ocean and algae. So they have pretty small teeth. But if they are uh, carnivorous, if they're eating things like urchins or crabs, things with harder shells, they're going to have um, strong teeth. So the California sheephead, for example, um, that half black, half red fish, they eat urchins. Um, and similar to crabs, they have pretty strong shells. And so they will slowly break apart that outer shell and then eat the meat that's inside. Wow. That's, am I, I heard that and I was just like, what? Because <laughs> it almost seems like, you know, I've looked into a fish aquarium and it doesn't even seem like they're eating. Like it's just kind mm -hmm. of like a, a swallowing function. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some, some will like swallow other fish whole and then like spit out the bones or the shell. Um, yeah. There could be some cool, a cool little like YouTube deep dive on um, just different fish diets and seeing what that looks like. Right. Absolutely. And then my last question for you is again, um, as we're going through the presentation and you were taking us underwater, you know, the ROVs being able to take us into those areas where there's not a lot of light, um, you know, where we see more, um, of that deep sea life versus the human and animal life that we're more familiar with on land. Um, so my question is, what um, what's important to know about the difference between ocean life and um, life here on land, if there even is a difference, um, especially when it comes to conservation? Hmm, that's a great question. Um... Let's see. Maybe there is no difference. In it. Yeah, well, you know, there's different there's different resources available for animals. Um, you know, animals on land, they're utilizing different kinds of habitats. You know, on land we have rivers and trees that animals are using as habitats and meadows. And underwater we have natural reefs, artificial reefs, um, sandy bottoms, you know, rocky reefs. And so there's a difference in habitats. Um, but still, they, in, in the water, they face different challenges. So the um, destruction of some of these habitats is a challenge. Um, warming water temperatures is a challenge. Mm. Um, we are fishing our oceans very hard. So we're taking a lot of animals like um, fish and lobster and squid for calamari out of the ocean. Um, so that limits the amount of available food for animals that live in the ocean. Um, and it's tough for some of these populations to repopulate. Um, so there definitely are some different challenges taking place underwater, um, but we can still approach them in a similar way, you know, focusing on reducing our use of plastic, uh, reducing our, um, our like, use of um, reducing our carbon emissions, um, you know, making choices that are more aligned with the environment. Um, so we can approach them in the same way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely, um, I, I'm downloading some apps after this. Mm -hmm. I, I really think those were great takeaways that you ended mm -hmm. on as far as, you know, even if, you um, you know, you're, you're a kid who doesn't live near the ocean, um, the things that you can do um, to positively impact the ocean. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank you for um, being our STEM in the City speaker. Definitely wanted to um, give you the opportunity to share any last parting words, um, but we really loved learning so much about um, ocean science today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was great to be here. Um, great to connect with you all again. Um, I think my parting words would be, if there's something that you're passionate about, go for it. There's so many resources out there to help you. Um, and, you know, I, as I mentioned, when I was younger, I didn't know any scientists, especially any Latina scientists that looked like me. And um, that was intimidating. I thought, is this a space that I could be in? Are there other Latinos in the STEM field? And there are. There's um, people, you know, that are out there who can help guide you and, and help 
you um, pursue a career, whether it's in the STEM field or not. Um, so if there's something that you're passionate about, go for it. You have the skills um, and the knowledge to pursue it and be successful. Absolutely. Okay. Once again, Carlin, thank you for leading that great Q and A. Um, you know, especially when you ask the question about fish eating crabs, right? Because I'm always like, <laughs> you know, you think like everything that swims in the ocean eats like plant life, right? Or those little little what are they called? Like the little plankton planting it. Yes, those things, mm -hmm. right? And you know, like the bigger fish, right? eat fish, but you never think, okay, a regular size fish can eat a crab, right? Like crab is tasty. So I get it, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, thank you, Carlin, for leading an informative Q&A. Thank you, Jacqueline, for teaching us so much about the ocean and how we study it in um, pursuing a career in marine science. And so mm -hmm. I just want to thank everybody for their time. Carlin has put the survey in the chat. So whether you're watching it live or catching it later on our YouTube channel, please take a few moments to complete the survey. That helps us continue to bring this virtual programming to you. And our next program year, if you were in Atlanta, when we started in person, the surveys collect data that help us continue to get funding to show um, the impact of our work. And we want to continue to bring these great programs to you where you can explore different STEM careers because we need, okay, Jacqueline, my question is, I learned the other day that there is a shortage in soil scientists, right? Mm. And it is not because, it's mainly because awareness, right? Like kids don't know that that is a career path. Mm -hmm. Is that the same thing in marine scientists? Are there more marine scientist jobs than are filled because not enough people are going into that field? I'm not sure if there's a shortage. Um, I think more and more compared to when I went to college in, I started college in 2010 to now there are so many more marine science programs at colleges. So I would say it's a field that's growing and a lot of funding is going towards marine science and ocean science. Um, but we, there's definitely, a, a, I would say a lack of diversity and a lack of women in this field. So um, yeah, we're hoping to just bring in a lot of diverse perspectives because there's challenging problems that are facing our environment and we need a diverse set of minds to help solve these problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you like fish, if you like water, if you like the beach, consider a career in marine scientists because our teen science cafe speaker used to be a fishery biologist. And so, wow. you know, yes, you want to save the planet, but if nothing else, if all you can think about is I like crab, I like seafood, <laughs> I like oysters, and the ocean needs to stay clean and healthy, then consider a career in marine science. There is a place for you, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jacqueline. And yeah, thank um, you. And thank you everyone for joining us for our STEM in the City. We hope you have a great rest of the day and we will see you at future SEM Link programs. And you can catch this or any other program on our YouTube channel. Have a great rest of your day. Mm -hmm.